I'm Stephanie Fetzko. I'm a third year medical student and I was part of the Global Health Study Program for my third year project. Well, I was interested for third year doing something combining environment and health and through talking with um, Dennis Clements here at the Global Health Institute, um, we came up with a project uh, looking at pesticide exposure in farm workers in rural Honduras. He had had a student a few years ago doing something with the Nicholas School um, and she had done a very small pilot project with some farm workers in Honduras and so we were looking to expand that with some more workers and also add um, some other components to the study. Um, we were looking at both dermal exposure um, through a tape stripping technique on the skin after the workers were uh, spraying in the fields and then also uh, collecting urine samples in order to assess systemic exposure um, and what is possibly the absorbed dose that um, the workers are really being exposed to in the fields after they've sprayed. Number one, they use a tremendous amount of pesticides um, and unlike the United States and many other developed countries, there isn't a uh, very stringent regulation of what chemicals are there. And so some of the chemicals that are actually banned in the U.S. are still used in places like Honduras. And so they're more toxic chemicals that can lead to more acute poisonings and symptoms and also chronic symptoms. And then another issue is that the land managers very infrequently provide any per personal protective equipment such as chemical resistant gloves, goggles, masks. Um, and so you have workers that are going out there mixing pesticides, you know, loading it into, they have these backpack sprayers that they load them into that are gasoline powered and a spray wand. Um, but they're out there in short sleeves, no goggles, no masks. Um, they do have rubber boots and they protect their legs, but their arms are usually pretty much fully exposed from what I saw. And the only thing that occasionally I saw in terms of protective equipment were some workers would put um, like a handkerchief tied around their face, but they'd also move that up and down a lot because of the heat. And that's a big problem there is that because it's so hot, some of the workers are like, even if I had it, I want to use it because it's just too hot and if I had goggles on and I'm spraying it, the spray would get on the goggles and I had to wipe it all the time and it would just slow them down and they were very much so it was hard work and so they wanted to be quick and efficient about that so anything that slowed them down they didn't want to do but there are also workers who very much so did want personal protective equipment and said they would use it if it was given to them they just can't afford it themselves. We would sample from their forearms and their hands and also um, somewhere on their face or neck. Um, and so, and we do that at each site three consecutive times to look to see if there was penetration within the stratum corneum. We're still running the analysis right now and so I don't have the exposure levels yet, but after the worker sprayed, um, you definitely would see residue on their skin. So we expect that, you know, some of the workers will definitely have a fair amount of exposure because of the lack of personal protective equipment. Being on the ground there and learning how, how many people you need to kind of just get your foot in the door to working with um, a group of people out in a community where they don't have, they've never had any interaction with researchers before, the people that I worked with. Um, and also just learning the challenges of doing that type of field-based research because follow-up with the urine samples was very difficult because I got pre-exposure samples from them and then the following morning I would need to get um, post-exposure samples from them and that was very challenging because just the nature of their work schedule there and the fact that they're day laborers and that they may be at home in their village um, needing to do something for their family that day and not show up to work and not really tell anyone it's just things were more fluid there and so that was kind of difficult and so in the future if I was to do it I would have probably tried it would have taken me longer but tried to set up maybe home appointments for getting those post-exposure samples, which would mean, you know, hiking out to wherever they lived 
So taking more time and not being able to do samples for someone else that day. But so things like that, just having to adjust. Dr. Clements, we would Skype during my time there. And so just kind of getting the encouragement from him that, you know, and th with the slow pace of things that, you know, you know, this is how research really is sometimes. And you've got to be persistent and just keep going and keep going. And so, um, and just his knowledge of Honduras was, was helpful throughout. During medical school is a great time to go and get experience doing a project independently um, and being in a different country. And you know, for me, it was pretty extreme being literally out in the field doing my project. But to just to see what challenges really exist with doing it, and it gave me more confidence that in the future, um, you know, as a resident or an attending in the future, that. I will want to continue and do some type of work abroad and that, um, and that I can. <laughs> you know, things didn't go perfectly, and they never do, um, but um, I definitely want to pursue more work in a Spanish-speaking country in the future.